Praise the Lord. This is Dr. C. Dexter Wise III, and welcome to TNT. TNT, as you know, stands for Tuesday Night Teaching. It's Tuesday night, and I'm teaching. Okay, you know the drill. And uh, you've picked a great time to join us because we are just at the beginning of a brand new series. This is session two. You can go back and check out session number one on our YouTube channel or on our Facebook page or pages. And by the way, you can get the notes to this whole series by going to our church website, faithministries.church. And uh, when you get to faithministries.church, you'll go to the menu bar. When you look to the menu bar, you'll see the word grow, click grow. After you click grow, there'll be a drop down menu from grow, which says TNT, click that, and under that you'll see the notes for our new series, Heaven on Earth. And so we ask that at this time that you share with your friends and family members, let them know that uh, we're on the air with TNT, and we welcome you. Whether you're joining us from across the street, across the city, across the country, across the continent, or anywhere in the multiversity, we're glad to have you with us tonight. As I said, we're starting a new series. We started it last week. It's entitled Heaven on Earth. What is it? Where to find it? And how to keep it? Well, the last session was about Babel and what not to do to get heaven on earth. We spent a lot of time looking at the builders of Babel, how they intended to create heaven on earth, how they intended to build a stairway from heaven to earth, how they intended to really basically replace heaven with earth. But that didn't work because God saw what they were doing. He came down, disrupted the building and scattered them all over the world. So that's a good example of what not to do. And as I said, if you missed it, you can go back and review it uh, in uh, on some of these platforms. This week in session number two, we're going to look at an example of heaven on earth. Last week, we talked about how not to get it. Well, this week, we're going to talk about what it looks like when you have it. Uh, we're looking at this manna from heaven. The manna from heaven is the scripture that we'll be using. We call it manna because it's the bread of life that comes from God. And it is, of course, the scripture. So you see that in your notes. I'm going to read that into the record. Have a word of prayer. And then we're going to get busy. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. That's Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 8. Okay, now that you know where we are, what we're doing, let's bow for a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for this <clears throat> opportunity to come together <clears throat> and to talk with your people about what it is that you would have us to do who it is you would have us to be, and how it is you would have us to live. We ask that you enter into our deliberations, enter into our discussions, enter into our decisions that we might learn something and that we might become a little bit nearer to you as we talk about your word today. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake, amen. <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> look at that section there that says missing heaven on earth. And we use that title because we're suggesting that in every case, in every age, in every culture, there is this sense of missing heaven or a hunger for heaven. So let's look at that section, missing heaven on earth. You'll know. If we acknowledge and agree that there is in us a hunger for heaven, the next questions become, what is heaven? And where do we find it? 
the best response to these may be like the answer to the question, how do you know you're in love? Well, you know you're in love because you won't have to ask anybody and nobody will have to tell you, you'll know. Just as different people love different things or different people love different things for different reasons, heaven on earth is not the same for everyone. Truly, every person's heaven or one person's heaven may be another person's hell and vice versa. Still, as we may be able to see from this passage in Mark chapter 9, there are some characteristics of heaven on earth which may be typical across the board. So no two people have the same concept of heaven. No two people think heaven is the same thing, but there are some characteristics that are common to what people would say, this is heaven on earth. Let me add something to your notes here and suggest to you that heaven on earth is when heaven and earth intersect. It is the place, it is the space, it is the experience where heaven and earth intersect. Where there's a part of heaven that's real heaven, and there's a part of earth that's real earth and they come together and you happen to be there when it happens. Sometimes there's an intersection like a lightning bolt which just strikes and it's over. And sometimes it's like an overlap where there is an extended period of time where heaven and earth come together. Came to my mind as I was thinking about this just a few minutes ago. I was thinking about when Jesus joined those two men who were on the way to Emmaus. You remember that? They were walking and he joined them and began to talk to them about the events that had taken place in Jerusalem. And uh, after they began to talk to him, after he revealed himself to them, here's what they said. They, they said, did not our hearts burn within us? as the man of God spoke with us by the wayside. And so Jesus came into their, their conversation. He didn't just intervene into their conversation or interrupt their conversation, but he participated in it. He walked with them, he stayed with them, he ate with them, and then he disappeared. So sometimes heaven and, and earth come together just as an instant. And sometimes they overlap for a minute, but in either case, it is an intersection. It is a coming together. It is a place where a little bit of heaven and a little bit of earth take place at the same time and you happen to be present. Uh, sometimes heaven and earth come together and you're not there where well, you don't experience, but praise God for the times when heaven and earth come together and you are there when it happens, okay? All right, this manifestation of heaven on earth. I'll take you there. Peter, James, and John were unexpectedly ushered into heaven on earth as they followed Jesus to a certain mountaintop. To be sure, notice what happened there, which facilitated this beatific experience. Number one, Jesus took them there. See that scripture where it says, now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, they didn't just stumble there, Jesus took them there. That reminds me of the staple singers, you know, they have this song says, I know a place, ain't nobody crying, ain't nobody worried, ain't nobody smiling, ain't no lying to the races, help me, come on, help me, somebody help me, I'll take you there. And then they say, oh, let me take you there. I'll take you there, but you gotta let me take you there. And Jesus was able to take them there because he knew the way. The only way they got to the top of that mountain, the only way they got to experience what they experienced that day is because Jesus took them there. And my sisters and brothers, at some point, it's not something that we do. It may be that heaven on earth is just a matter of following a person who has been there before. Have you ever had a travel guide? Have you ever had a tour guide? Have you ever been on a cruise or somewhere and the person takes you to a place that you've never been before? And they tell you all, all the time, say, this is gonna be great, this is gonna be great, say, ah, I don't know. But when they take you there, say, wow, you did not lie. It was really true. Sometimes people have been to a place. They have had an experience. They have been able to be in a certain presence, in a certain environment, and they know what it feels like. 
and they have the ability to take you there. And so there are people who lead us to heaven on earth. There are people who can teach us how to have this experience uh, of heaven on earth. And these typically are people who have already been there before. And so they were there on the mountaintop because Jesus took them there. He took them there. Praise God for the fact that Jesus thought enough of them, Peter, James, and John. He didn't take everybody, but he took Peter, James, and John with him. That's how they got that experience because Jesus led them there. Heaven on earth is often ex an experience which comes to you as a result of you following the lead of the Lord, where he leads you, he leads you into this heaven on earth experience. You got that? So the first thing that happened is Jesus took them and, and that's how they got to that heaven on earth experience. Second thing, Jesus led them apart by themselves. Scripture says, and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. I do not want you to miss that phrase apart by themselves. Sometimes earth can become so mundane. Earth can become so routine. Earth can become so average and normal that the only way that we can have a heaven on earth experience is to get away from it. And not just get away from earth, I'm not saying that you need to be beamed up like Scotty, but you need to get away from earthly burdens, earthly pleasures, if you will, earthly troubles, earthly trials, and go apart by yourself. Heaven on earth is an experience which oftentimes only takes place once you have come apart from the earth, which you have taken yourself out of the environment, once you have stepped away, while you're still on earth, we're not talking about you rocketing anywhere, but you've disengaged from the, the earthly and the gravity that it is involved with being a human being on this planet, and you go apart by yourself or with others who are heavenly minded. Jesus did not just take them up to a mountain so that they could see a height. He did not just take them up on a mountain so that they could see the beauty. He took them up on a mountain so that they could be by themselves. And I don't know about you, but sometimes some of the best heaven on earth experiences you can have is when you're by yourself. Or when you buy yourself with people that you love and have the same kind of mindset. When you're with people who are conflicting with you and you're people who are fighting with you and you're people who are arguing with you, people who are criticizing you, that's not particularly heaven on earth. But when you find a soul mate, when you find a soul mind, when you find a person who appreciates the things you appreciate, love the things you love, that can be heaven on earth. But sometimes you've got to be apart by yourself because everybody ain't like that. Everybody doesn't appreciate those kinds of things. So Jesus did not just lead them to the mountaintop, but he led them apart by themselves. What you're about to experience, Peter, James and John, you cannot experience in the valley. And you cannot experience in the crowd. I've got to take you away from all of that apart by yourself. And if you are unwilling, you're unwilling every now and then to separate yourself from the normal, separate yourself from the average, separate yourself from every day, you might miss some heaven on earth. He took them away. He led them to heaven on earth and he did it by setting them or taking them apart by themselves. AK, okay, okay, amen. I'll get it right in a minute. Number three, Jesus showed himself to them in a way they had never seen him before, and he was transfigured before them. Now this word transfigured, that's a big word, not really sure what it means, but in other words, he had a figure, and then he had a trans <laughs> and uh, he was he was changed. His his face was changed. His clothes were sh changed. The verse says that his clothes became shining exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. Tide couldn't do it. Clorox couldn't do it. Taking it to the cleaners. His clothes became so white that they, they were whiter than anyone had ever seen before. His face uh, took on a new, new kind of form because while they were looking at him, he had become transfigured before them. Now listen, heaven on earth is a disclosure 
or revelation of something which may have been hidden in plain view. It's a disclosure or revelation of something which may have been hidden in plain view. They had been walking with Jesus all this time. They've been rooming with Jesus. They've been eating with Jesus. They've been watching Jesus. But until they saw this revelation of Jesus, they saw his heavenly side on earth. Okay, so it's like, it's like if you remember, remember uh, Eddie Murphy in, um, in Coming to America. Okay, when he came to America, he was working in like a little McDowell's uh, takeoff or McDonald's. Okay, so, so he was just a, a servant cleaning up. But nobody there saw his heavenly, his heavenly, not his heavenly side, his royal side. They did not know that he was a prince. They did not know his father was a king because he was dressed up in earthly garments. And it was not until he went back home that it was revealed that this is who he was and this is uh, the life that he really lived. And so what Jesus did for Peter, James, and John on that mountain is he disclosed himself. He disrobed, if you will, his humanity, showed them his divinity, and they saw Jesus in a light they had never seen him before. And so when heaven on earth takes place, here's what happens. We see the inherent holiness of a thing which we may have never considered before. They've been looking at Jesus all this time. They've been watching Jesus. They've been walking with Jesus, talking with Jesus, eating with Jesus. But he's just Jesus. Well, they know he does, you know, miraculous stuff. But he's just basically Jesus. They've seen the power coming from Jesus. But they never saw Jesus as this heavenly being. And so here was something that they kind of looked at as an ordinary thing. A man, Jesus, though he was extraordinary, they still looked at him as an ordinary man. But they saw something they had never seen before. There was a revelation. There was a disclosure. There was a heavenliness about an earthly thing called Jesus. And every now and then we have that experience of something that is common, something that is plain. And just in that moment, that common thing seems heavenly. That common thing seems extraordinary. That common thing seems like a revelation. For example, a sunset. Well, the sun comes up every day, praise the Lord. But sometimes when you look at the sunset, it's not just a sunset, it's a revelation. It's, it, it's, it's, it's an experience, it's a holy experience. It's heaven on earth. Sometimes just watching the waves of an ocean. You know, I like to go to the ocean, but I don't like to get in it. <laughs> I know how to swim, but I don't want to get in that ocean because there's sharks in the ocean. There's salt in the ocean. I, I, I put my toes in it, but, but I don't like to get in the ocean. But what I like to do, I like to look at the ocean. I like to, to, to be on the balcony of a hotel or of a condominium that's facing the ocean and just sit there and watch the waves. I've done that all over the world, just watching the waves. That does something for me. And heaven on earth is just watching the waves. Ain't nothing deep, but it's watching the waves. For some people, it may be the wind through the trees in a forest. But it's just a simple thing that you haven't seen or, or you've been seeing all your life. But in that instant, in that instant, you see it in a way that you've never seen it before. They've been seeing Jesus all this time. But when they looked at Jesus this time, there was a revelation. There was a disclosure. This is not just Jesus. This is the son of God. This is the son of God. And look at him in his holiness. We've never seen him like this. We've seen him walk on water. We've seen him still the storm, but we've never seen all of this holiness around Jesus in our presence. It's sort of like Jesus just gave them a peep of who he really was, which leads me to my fourth point, And that is that Jesus was perceived operating and conversing in his heavenly context. Verse number four says, and Elijah appeared to them with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. Now, they've been used to seeing Jesus enter into uh, situations and work miracles and so on and so forth. They've been used to Jesus preaching and all of that, but they never saw Jesus in his heavenly element. They saw him in his earthly element talking to people, conversing with people, but they never saw him in his heavenly element, conversing with Moses, Elijah, and other beings that were 
in heaven. And so what they actually got a chance to see is not just the heavenliness of Jesus. They got to see Jesus in action in a heavenly way. Let me see if I can break this down to you like this. Um, he was in his element. He was in his element. There are so many people that we see. And when we see them on the street or when we see them in a house or when we see them at school, they, they, they just seem like regular, normal people. And sometimes not just normal, but abnormal, not extraordinary, but abnormal people. But then when you see them in their element, it seems like something, some kind of transformation takes place of them such that they become more natural. They become more fluid. They become more engaged when they are in their element. For example, uh, a lot of basketball players, you know, first they're 100 feet tall, which means they don't fit in anywhere. They, they almost look like freaks. That's a terrible word, but they look like freaks because they're so big. They're so tall. They can't fit in anywhere. When they're on the street, they look like they don't fit. Uh, by the way, let me give you a little experiment. Go to Office Max and stand next to one of those cutouts of Shaquille O'Neal. I mean, it is huge. They have this cardboard cutout of him that he's uh, selling some kind of ink or something. But when you stand next to that, you're like, whoa, and that's just the cardboard. What would it be like if he was in person? If you see somebody like that outside of the basketball arena, they look like, wow, they are kind of awkward. Some of these athletes, not only do they look awkward, but they talk awkward if they talk at all. But when they get in the element, when they get inside the white lines, when they get on the field, when they get uh, in the pool, when they get on the equipment, there's a transformation that takes place. There's something that comes out of them that has always been inside of them that you have never seen and you'll never see it unless they are in their element. And so you have the goofy uh, athletes who, uh, who, who are not very articulate, but when they get in their element, they are like heavenly. <laughs> they are like heavenly in what they do. And that's why we pay money to go see them. We may not pay money to listen to them talk, but we pay money to watch them perform because when they are in their element, it's like heaven on earth. And so what happened to Peter, James and John is that they had spent all this time with Jesus in their lives, but they had never seen him in his element. They never seen him talk in such a way that he had uh, Moses and Elijah, not as his peers, but as being superior to them, they'd never seen him like that. And so this is something that gave them an experience of heaven on earth because they got a chance to see Jesus in this environment and they were there when it happened. And then number five, Peter didn't want to leave. Verse five says, then Peter answered and said, Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Here, here was Peter's plan. This is great up here. This is great. Let's make it permanent. <laughs> Let's make it permanent. If you ever experience anything close to heaven on earth, it ain't something you want to leave. It's not something you want to just say, okay, let's quit. It's like something, can we do this some more? Can I stay here a little bit longer? How can I make it permanent? That's our first reaction. If we ever get it, how can we keep it? Let's stay here. Peter said, let's build three tabernacles, one for, for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. But, but he kind of gave away his own problem because he said tabernacle and a tabernacle is a tent and a tent is temporary. So whatever you build to try to make heaven on earth stay, it won't last very long because it's only a tabernacle. But the fact of the matter is that when you have this experience, one of your first reactions is never let it in. Number six, Peter didn't know what to say. Well, that's obvious. He never knows what to say. When he had this heaven on earth experience, he didn't know what to say because he did not know what to say. That's what verse, verse six says, for they were greatly afraid. Sometimes the best response to heaven on earth is silence. Don't say nothing because whatever you say is, is going to take you out of whatever you're in because it's not going to equal what you're experiencing. Have you ever been eating food? I mean, somebody uh, good cook and you eat their food and while you're chewing it, somebody asks you, how is it? 
But you can't stop. <laughs> you can't stop chewing because you're so busy enjoying it. And the only thing you can say, mm, mm, you can't. Don't interrupt my enjoyment because if I speak, I'm going to break the experience that I'm having. I've just got to stop talking and enjoy this heavenly experience. And that's what happens sometimes. When you get to the place where you experience the presence of God, when you get to the place where you feel that something from heaven has reached down and touched you and touched your life, that ain't the time for you to be talking. That's the time for you to be enjoying. That's the time for you to be basking. That's the time for you to be thanking God for the fact that this has happened to you. And so it does happen that sometimes when we experience it, we don't know what to say. And that's okay because the best thing to say sometimes is not to say nothing. And then finally, number seven to be mentioned here, God put the focus on Jesus. God put the focus on Jesus. Verse seven says, and a cloud came and overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud and said, this is my beloved son, hear him. Suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. They were excited about the transfiguration itself, but God said, hear him. And that's another challenge. That's another challenge. Sometimes when we have these experiences uh, where we feel like heaven and earth have come together and we were there to see it, we marvel at the experience and, and, and all of the, the aura about it, but we miss the Jesus in it. What was the message in it? What was the master saying in it? What was he revealing to us? Don't just watch it as if, wow, that was wonderful. And sometimes I'm guilty of that. When I, when I see things, for example, if I see a movie, I'm so much in awe about how they did it that I might miss the story. I mean, how did they do that? How did they get that car to flip over three times? How did they have a car come out of an airplane on a parachute and land on the side of a road? I'm more into how it's done than the message of the story. Story. And that happens so many times when God intersects, when God comes into our lives. We get so excited about the process. We get so excited about the, the, the things that surrounded the experience that we forget to hear him. We forget to hear him and to see him and to learn from him and to see what revelation he's trying to give to us. And so as we look at this passage, this scripture, we see that we have three men, Peter, James and John, who are disciples of Jesus. And Jesus thought enough of them to give them a heaven on earth experience. How did it happen? Number one, he took them there. They didn't know where they were going. They didn't know how to get there, but they got it because he took them there. Secondly, he led them apart by themselves. They could not experience it hanging around other people, certain other people. So he took them apart by themselves. And then while he was there, he showed himself to them in a way that they had never seen him before. And so they experienced heaven on earth, not because they saw anything they had never seen, but because they saw what they had always been seeing in a new way. And number four, Jesus was perceived operating and conversing in his heavenly context. They saw Jesus acting like the son of God with other celestial beings. Number five, when you have heaven on earth like Peter, you don't want to leave. Number six, Peter didn't know what to say, so he started talking, but he should have just been quiet. And then number seven, God put the focus on Jesus. Heaven on earth is an opportunity to experience the intersection of the heavenly with the earthly, but don't have that experience without looking for Jesus without listening to Jesus, without learning from, from Jesus, and without seeking to live, from Jesus, live for Jesus on the other side of that experience. And by the way, uh, as you will know, if you keep on reading in the ninth chapter of Mark, when they come down from the mountain, it was a demoniac waiting for them. 
a man with a son who was possessed with a devil was waiting for them when they came down from this heaven on earth experience. So you can't keep it. It won't last for long. Enjoy it while it's lasting because after it's over, you don't know what you're going to face when you come down. Okay, that's enough for now. We're going to stop right here and uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask some questions and you can type them in as you normally do. Send those questions along. I'm going to step away. I'll step away for a second, then I'll come back, answer your questions, and see if you, for example, have had a heaven on earth experience, a time where you felt like heaven and earth intersected, and you were blessed to be there when it happened. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this privilege and this opportunity to talk with your people about you. We thank you for the fact that every now and then you will take us there. You will take us apart by ourselves. And when we're apart by ourselves, you will show us yourself in a way that we've never seen before and empower us that when we come down from those experiences, we're able to face just about anything. In Jesus name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Okay, that's it. I'm going to step away. Don't you step away. I'll step away and I'll be right back in just a minute. Okay, just a heads up before I take some questions that you may have uh, about this uh, session tonight. Um, this is a multivalence approach to uh, presenting uh, these messages through these series. Number one, we have the actual notes. And in the notes we share with you, um, you can read up on them, you can fill them in as we go. And then there's a very important part at the bottom. Those are the questions that they are there at the bottom. And you can use those questions for your own personal study. You can use those questions to get a little bit deeper into the, into the topic. And then just to think a little bit more about what I said. Uh, it's amazing, in fact, it's not amazing, but you may have revelations that the Lord will speak to you as you are listening, as you're watching, and as you answer these questions to prompt you to think. So you have the actual notes. Then you actually have my teaching, which is what I'm doing right now. I take those notes and they're like skin and bones and I put some meat on them and maybe put a little uh, decoration on them. That's the actual teaching. And then we come to Sunday where we preach on them and that's where we not just put on the meat, but we put the clothes on, the earrings, the lipstick, the makeup, and we fully uh, flesh out, if you will, uh, this message and this word. So there are various places where you can plug in various ways that you can get it, various ways that you can make sure that you get this idea. And that's what we try to do with all of our series. We're trying to put it in such a place, in such a way that everybody can get something at every level and uh, get the uh, idea that's going on. So don't forget those questions down there at the bottom of your notes after each lesson. They give you an opportunity to ask yourself the questions. Actually, I'm asking you a question and you can respond in your own way. Okay, having said that, who has a question for me? Is there somebody who has a question that they'd like to ask? There's Lou, you're back. Okay. Can you elaborate on how we can see more things hidden in plain sight, good or bad? Well, that's true. Um, there's so many things that we see that we don't see. We've got used to not seeing them. Uh, let me give you an example that I'm sure you will uh, recognize, Lou. Uh, you may not admit it, but I'm sure you'll recognize. You know that girl who was in the third grade, you know, the one with the, with the pigtails and the thick glasses and the teeth separated. You know that girl? Well, you kind of walked past her, didn't pay no attention to her. But by the ninth grade, uh-huh, is the same girl, but you saw her, okay? She was hidden in plain sight. Uh, she, she just was the same person on the inside 
but you looked at her in a different way. And that happens with people. That happens with houses. You're going to buy a house and you look at it like, uh, you come back again like, wow. You see it in a different way. Uh, there are not only people do we see in different ways. We see situations in different ways. We see opportunities in different ways. And some of these things are hidden in plain sight. I don't know how many times I've looked all over the house for my phone, but couldn't find it because right there on my desk, is a, it's a black phone and the black phone is on a dark desk and it didn't stand out. So it was hidden right in plain sight. And many of these opportunities, many of these beautiful experiences are all around us. I I mean, in our backyard, we see flowers we hadn't seen before. We see animals. We hear birds. We see all of these things are right around us. We don't have to go anywhere, but we've just been so busy with ourselves, so busy, bound to the things around us that we aren't free enough to see them. And many times the very answer that you're looking for is right in front of your face, but you aren't able to see it because it's hidden in plain sight. And that's when God does a revelation, which is to take the cover off, to reveal, to unveil those things which are right there in plain sight. Miss Willie Jones, if the spirit of the Lord falls on you and you can only praise him, is that heaven on earth? Well, I'm sure it feels like it. It's, it's an intersection. Remember what I was saying, that heaven on earth is when heaven and earth either intersect for a moment or overlap. And uh, when the spirit falls upon you and uh, you become saturated with that spirit, that spirit overtakes you and you begin to praise him, that is an expression. Uh, and that's an expression of your acknowledgement that that is a moment of heaven on earth. And as I say, sometimes it lasts for a moment like lightning, and sometimes it lasts for an extended period like Peter, James, and John did up on the mountain. But it's an intersection. It's when heaven and earth meet, and you happen to be there. It's not just that heaven and earth meet. It's like when a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you there to hear it. And that's when you experience heaven on earth is when you are there when the intersection takes place. Another question. Miss Sheila Welch, can an out of body experience in the area uh, be an be in the area of heaven? Absolutely. Let me read that again. Can an out of body experience be in the area of heaven on earth? Yes, because sometimes when you go out of body, you don't go to heaven. <laughs> the experience you have is not an experience of being in heaven. But heaven on earth is sort of like you're, you're detached from the things that hold you. You're, you're separated from the things that bind you to the earth. It's like anti-gravity you know you don't have gravity and the things of the earth that bind you no longer have their hold on you they no longer have their hold on your consciousness they no longer have their their hold on your physical um issues or your physical uh considerations and somehow you are lifted even if only for a moment out of that earthly boundness earthly bondage up to a place where you sense something without those things. Now, I, I, I don't know if we should talk about you like being an astronaut without gravity, but I'm saying that out of body means that you have an experience that does not bind your consciousness, does not bind what you are thinking to the fact that you're in a body. It's almost, I don't know if you've had this experience and I've had this as if you are out of your body looking at yourself. You know you have a body and you know you have a self and you know you're not dead, but what's happening to you, it's, it's like you're not in your body when it's happening. And sometimes when those things happen, you can have an out of body experience, but what you experience is not heaven. It could be horror. It could be a nightmare. But many times when you are uh, having such an out of body experience and it is a pleasant experience, it can be like heaven on earth. It's been said that because God created us, we are spiritual beings having earthly experience. How can we increase our heaven on earth experiences in an earthly environment? That's a deep question, Sister Lee. And uh, the answer goes back to what I was trying to say with Sister Welch. And that is, of course, we have a spirit in us. God is a spirit. 
They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so when he made us in his image, the image was not just his physical image, but the image was also to have to be spiritual beings. But because we are in flesh, that spirit is bound, is in a cage, is imprisoned by the body. So in order for that spirit to be able to connect with the spirit that made it God in a real way, in a in a in a uh, condensed in an intense in a pure way somehow we got to get the body out of the way because the body is hindering our spiritual connection so what happens is the more our spirits take over our bodies the closer we can get to experiencing heaven on earth and what happens when you have a heaven on earth experience a hundred times out of 10, I'm say a hundred times out of 10, your body becomes less important than your mind, than your spirit, than your soul. And the experiences of your soul, the experiences of your heart, the experiences of your mind overrule, override, and in many cases, subject, subdue, and submit the dictates of the flesh. And so that that's what happens. It's not that we don't we aren't earthly beings and it's not that we don't have a spiritual aspect. It's just that heaven on earth takes place when the spiritual aspect of us rises above all of those barriers and burdens that are based on us being earthly beings. That's a good question. As my man, Mr. Stephen Wilson, how did Peter, James and John know who Elijah and Moses were when they didn't know them personally? That's a good question. Uh, when we go to glory, will we recognize them and others who have gone before? Well, that's a good question. I don't think anybody ever, ever asked me that. How did they know it was was Moses, Elijah? Uh, because they did, I don't know if they had name tags or not. But uh, that's a good question. They certainly knew it after they were identified as such by God. But maybe they knew it by uh, the way they appeared. Perhaps one appeared with the tablets. The other appeared, you know, in a prophetic way. I really don't know the answer. But the scripture says it was Moses. It was Elijah. Of course, they were conversing with each other. It could have been that Jesus identified them as such. But we don't really know the answer to that. How did he know? And that's a good question. How do you know that? How did you just know that wasn't just some old guy up there uh, talking with Jesus? And then when we go to glory, when we recognize others who have gone before. Um, let's put it this way. We're not going to have the same bodies when we get there. Because we uh, will be um, sown in corruption and uh, reaped in uncorruption, sown in mortality and reaped in immortality. In other words, uh, we will have a body, but our body won't be like this body. And so therefore, what it looks like, I don't know, but it won't look like the one we had. Now, will we recognize them? We have passages in scripture where people are talking, for example, that parable uh, where Jesus talks about Lazarus and Dives when they were separated at death, they were able to communicate, at least talk across the chasm. They weren't able to go across the chasm. And uh, Dives in hell could recognize that that was Lazarus up there in Abraham's bosom. And so the degree that we can do it, I don't know. Um, how What we will look like, I don't know. That's one of those get the glory and find the answer. My situation right now is I'm so focused on trying to get there. That's one of them questions I'm going to let take care of itself when I do. Brother Murph, Brother Murph, does joy and or peace always accompany the experience of heaven on earth? Um, I would say to a degree, yes, but people have different ideas of what joy and peace is. Um, you know, some person might consider joy the exhilaration of jumping out of an airplane. Well, you may not consider it that, but they may consider that joy. Uh, some people may consider it peace when they are underneath the ocean, you know, looking at fish. You may not consider that, but it's a sense of peace. I think I think the heaven on earth is. Here's a word. Here's a word. 
homeostasis. This is, I don't know where this word came from right this moment, but I do know the word. It's, um, it's a word from science, which means everything is at a same level. It is at a level where there is no confusion, no division. It, it's where it's supposed to be. And you can, you can, provi you can uh, talk about that as joy. You can talk about that as peace. You can talk about that as, har as harmony. Uh, the Jews have a word for it. They call it shalom, which means peace. It doesn't mean hello and goodbye. It means a state of blessedness. It means a state where everything is like it ought to be. It means where there's not too much of this or too much of that. It's homeostasis. It's everything is what it's supposed to be. And um, when heaven on earth takes place, there is a sense that whatever is going on right now is what should be or what should have always been or what could be. And so joy and peace tend to accompany heaven on earth. I noticed you didn't say happiness because happiness seems to be a kind of fleeting thing, but joy is something which to me has a little higher uh, uh, rating to it than happiness, or should I say a deeper experience than happiness. And when you have heaven on earth, you experience that sense of joy and peace. And so you can have that in the middle of a conflict. You can have that in the middle of a, of a troubled situation. You can have that in the middle of a storm, but it's because at least within yourself, you have reached this state where things are where they should be on the inside, even if they're not on the outside. So I wonder if you can call and experience heaven on earth if you don't have some sense of joy and some sense of peace. All right, Miss Willie. One time I was in the hospital, I started feeling funny, called a nurse, and I was uh, watching it seem from above my body while the doctors and nurses were working on me. Was that a heavenly experience? It was an out of body experience, but not necessarily a heavenly experience. Because as I was telling Sister Welch a few minutes ago, you can have these out of body experiences where you feel like you're out of your body, you're out of the, the out, of, out of your mind, if you will, out of the earth, and you're looking back on the physical stuff that remains. But unless there is something heavenly that encounters you during that experience, it's an out of body experience, but not a heavenly heaven on earth experience. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, so it's different. It's this it's, it's possible for you to be separated from your body, at least spiritually for a moment. And I know this sounds crazy, but those of you who's happened to, you know, it's possible that you feel like you're not you're not in your body. I remember one time I, um, I was asleep and I woke up and I couldn't move, but I could see everything around me, but I just couldn't move. And so I was, I was not, I guess I was in my body, but I was out of my body and I had no control of my body, but that was not a heaven on earth experience. That was terrifying. So you, you can have these experiences where you, you, you don't feel the, the, the pull the stress, the strains of your body, but just not feeling that doesn't make it heaven on earth. What makes it heaven on earth is once you get there, you are then met with some heavenly experience, some joy, some peace, whatever. So if you, if you had that out of body experience and it troubled you or frightened you, that's not heaven on earth. It becomes heaven on earth when you get out of those physical attachments and the experience that you have, going back to brother, what Brother Murph said, is joy and peace. These are all questions. Y'all must be woke. Okay. How is having a heavenly experience supposed to help us live our daily lives? That's a good question. The first, uh, Miss Amy, thank you for that. The first response is that when you have a heaven on earth experience, it makes you appreciate heaven and it makes you appreciate earth. It makes you appreciate heaven because it lets you know how beautiful that's going to be. It makes you appreciate earth because it lets you know that you can have this even in this earthly environment. It helps you with your daily lives because you will remember that I said earlier that sometimes when we have these uh, 
uh, heaven on earth experience like Peter, James, and John. We don't just see stuff, we hear stuff. And what they heard was they heard God tell them, there's Moses, there's Elijah, but look at my son, hear him. And then Moses and Elijah disappeared. So they got a message out of it. They got a revelation. They didn't just get an experience. <laughs> they got a word out of it. And sometimes the heaven on earth experience is not something that we can just say we felt it, but something is revealed to us that helps us live our lives after after it goes on. And so um, th that, that's what happens when we have these experiences. Sometimes we'll always remember we had the experience, but other times in the experience, we hear something, we sense something. It literally changes us that helps us live our lives in a different way, in a better way when we go forward. Brother William Jordan is having a vision of God seated on his throne and experience of having a heaven on earth, uh, having heaven on earth experience. Well, yeah, I guess, I guess, uh, especially if it happens when you are awake. Um, I'm not talking about a dream. I'm talking about when you are awake and have that experience. So you can see that you can see God seated on a throne in a dream and that's not necessarily a heaven on earth experience that's a dream <laughs> but what i'm talking about is when you are awake and in your awake state you see these things you sense these things you feel these things and to me that's a heaven on earth experience and, and it's not just the idea of seeing god seated on the throne but being in the presence it's not like you're just sitting there watching from a distance but God is seating on the throne, seated on the throne, and you're at the throne. That's what makes it a heaven on earth experience. Not just that you're watching a movie of God's greatest hits, but you are standing or kneeling at the throne where God is seated. That's a heaven on earth experience. Do we have any more questions about this heaven on earth experience or experiences? Last week we talked about what not to do. Today we gave an example of what a heaven on earth experience might be. I'd like for you to start thinking about some of those experiences that you had, some of those things that have happened to you that you said, this is heaven. I'm sure you've had them. I don't know how many you've had that uh, you may have been just sitting on an ocean, on a beach or somewhere on a cruise or whatever. But, but where were you when you said to yourself, this is heaven on earth? Were you in church? <laughs> were you in prayer? Were you on a mountain? Were you on vacation? Where were you? And what was it about that experience that made you call it heaven on earth? And to answer Amy's question, how did that change your life? Miss Angela, hey, good to see you. Good to see you. Accepting God's calling on your life. Can that be a heaven on earth experience even when this assignment is hard? Hmm. Well, number one, accepting the assignment is not necessarily heaven on earth unless you accept it like Moses. <laughs> when Moses saw the burning bush, that was pretty much heaven on earth. OK, so so that the way that that assignment came to him was a heaven on earth experience. Now, everybody, when they uh, accept or receive God's call in their life, doesn't have one of those kinds of heaven on earth experience where they have all these visions and dreams and stuff like that. Things appearing. But but it could be it could be. And out of that could come your confirmation, your assurance, your affirmation that this is what you want to do now. The assignment is hard. It does not feel like heaven while you're carrying out the assignment that you received in this heaven on earth experience. OK, so Jesus came to earth and by definition, he was heaven on earth. But uh, I'm sure it wasn't a whole lot of pleasure in the cross. It wasn't a whole lot of pleasure in Gethsemane. So the assignment, as you say, is hard. And overall, you are blessed and thankful that you could participate in the kingdom. But I'm talking about episodes in and out of and during this, you're committing or you're carrying out this assignment where you actually sense a super condensed, intense, uh, 
known conscious sense that that God, that heaven has invaded my space and I feel it right here. Overall, you know God has called you, you know God is leading you, God is guiding you, but there are moments where he, his presence is more pronounced than others. That does not mean he's absent in the other times. It just means that this time I really felt it. It's like the wind and air. The air is always there. If the air wasn't there, you'd suffocate and die. But every now and then the wind stirs up, the air stirs up. And wind is nothing but stirred up air. And I'm saying that God is like that. God is everywhere just like air is. But every now and then God stirs up. And when God stirs up and we feel that, we then feel heaven on earth. Other questions? Looks like I uh, struck a nerve here on this heaven on earth because it, it's something that we want. But I want to make sure that people understand that heaven on earth is not just feeling good. Because a lot of things make you feel good. And uh, not only do they make you feel good, and a lot of things give you an out-of-body experience, but once it, once it takes you out of your body, where do you go <laughs> and what do you get? I'm talking about this feeling, this sense of bliss, this sense of joy and peace, this sense of uh, homeostasis, if you will, that involves God. That involves God. That, that just can't come from earth. It's got to come from God. It's beyond the earth. It's above the earth. It invades the earth. It permeates the earth. And you are there when it happens. Okay, Miss Sheila, I was in church and the message was so awesome. I spoke in unknown tongues momentarily. It surprised me. That was heavenly to me. Okay, amen. I ain't mad at you. Yeah, heaven on earth experience. You're out of yourself. Out of yourself. How long it lasted, I don't know. But for the duration of that, it was heaven on earth. Intersection, I keep saying it over again. It's when heaven intersects with earth. If for a moment or for a brief duration, and you happen to be present when it does. When the uh, disciples were in the upper room and they had... Um, the Pentecostal experience, it was heaven on earth to them, but to the people outside, it was confusion because they weren't present when it happened. So, so you have to be present when it happens before it's a heaven on earth experience to you, to you. Miss Wanda, I felt an encounter with my dad when he was in hospice. Uh, it was unexplainable during his passing, joy and peace, okay? OK, well, the thing about it is that that your feeling, of course, of your dad passing is not something you're happy about. But the homeostasis, I keep saying this big, long word. But what I'm saying is even in his passing and with his passing, there was a sense that everything is like it should be. There's nothing that I should be upset about, nothing I should be uh, worried about, because this is the way it should be. And in some sense, there's a sense of peace about that. There's a sense of calm about that. There's even a sense of joy about that. Although people can look around and say, I don't know why you're acting like this. It's because that, that I'm at a place where I can sense God's presence, even in what some people might call a disaster. And so you can, you can see that, you can sense that. And this is one of those examples where you can be in the midst of a terrible, environment or terrible situation and yet have a sense that there's heaven even in this and it's the heaven in this that helps you to deal with this and that can be a heaven on earth experience is that it is that it well, that's enough of it. <laughs> that's enough. Well, uh, we're going to, God willing, come back on Sunday and uh, talk about this text some more. But uh, it has obviously struck a nerve with you because uh, it's something that you want. It's, it's nothing wrong with seeking this heaven on earth experience. But, but we ought not to seek it for the pleasure of it. 
because then we become junkies. We become Jesus junkies. And we just seek it so we can feel it. But these heaven on earth experiences are opportunities, not for us just to seek to feel good, but to sense a connection with who we really are. And it enlightens us, it empowers us, it redirects our lives. And in the end, it sensitizes us that, that this earth is not as bad as it looks because heaven is all around it. And if we have the right eyes, if we have the right attitudes, if we have the right sensitivities, we can not only see heaven on earth, but we can experience heaven on earth. Okay, we'll see you on Sunday at uh, Faith Ministries, 10 o'clock. It's Mother's Day, so don't forget, uh, if you can, if you're able to bring your mom with you, bring your mom with you, bring a flower for her, sit with your mom during worship, and we will call for you to stand with your mom and pin your flowers on your mom. We have our new seating arrangements this coming Sunday. We will be able to have more people in the sanctuary. We will seat in our regular process first where all of the people will be seated socially distanced and then after the sanctuary is full as we have normally done we will open up those uh, unoccupied aisles in between people people will be allowed to sit behind those people in that row just make sure you're not sitting behind somebody in front of you our ushers will help you to do it but i don't want you to miss church i want you to come and be a part of this celebration on sunday okay that's it for tonight We'll see you next time.